This is the Physical Activity Researcher Podcast, a podcast for researchers of sedentary behavior, physical activity, and sports. Join for a relaxed dialogue about research design, practicalities, and, well, anything related to research. Learn from your fellow researchers useful and relevant information that does not fit into formal content and limited space of scientific publications. And here is your host. Welcome, everyone. This is the Meaningful Sport Podcast, and I am your host, Nora Ronkainen. Meaningful Sport is a series of discussions on the why and how involvement in sport and physical activity can be an important part of a life worth living. We will also explore threats to meaningful engagement in sport and movement culture practices and ask questions about what we can learn about the human condition through our involvement in sport. The guests are leading scholars in human and social sciences of sport who share their explorations in a scholarly as well as a personal context. If you are interested in the theme, you might also want to check out MeaningfulSport.com. There you can find podcast show notes, read a blog, and access many resources for further explorations of meaningful sport. Today's episode is the second part of our discussions with Dr. Emily Ryle. In the first part, which I recommend you to check out, we discussed questions about seriousness and unseriousness of sport, and why such trivial activity can bring meaning to our lives. In today's episode, we focus on the idea of authenticity as it appears in existential philosophy. What does it mean to be authentic in sport? Can it look different in individual and team sports? And what can the organizers of sport do better to provide possibilities for athletes to be authentic? Dr. Emily Ryle is a reader in applied philosophy at the University of Gloucestershire who enjoys wrestling with the deep and difficult questions about sports. Her research explores a range of philosophical and ethical issues in sport, and in addition to these issues, she also teaches in areas of philosophy of science, critical thinking, and the logic of arguments. I hope you enjoy today's episode. I thought it would be a good point to move to your article, The Being on the Bench, an existential analysis of, of being a substitute in sport. So I wanted to take this paper up because um, it was published in 2008 and uh, I started my master's in 2009 and I was looking into literature on existentialism to use that in my, uh, in my dissertation on spirituality in sport. And so that was one of the first things I read and I, I really liked the discussion on authenticity that you had in the paper. So I thought I would really love to hear kind of the background of the paper and, and where the idea came from. Um, gosh, <laughs> well, A, it's amazing that anybody reads <laughs> reads these papers. So thank you. Um, I think I, I'm, I'm interested, I guess, in this idea of, um, uh, I guess, authenticity and, and free will and being true to yourself and what you can what kind of things you can have control over. Um, and I, you know, at the time I was also reading um, a lot of kind of existential literature like Camus and, and, and Sartre. And um, I think I tried to apply that to the concept of sports. And I'm talking about particular sports whereby you, and, and for my sport was, was rugby. And you could feasibly be part of a, a club or a team where actually you'd never got to play. So let, let's imagine a hypothetical team and you go along and you train and you train and you train and then the team gets selected for that weekend and you get told, okay, well, we've selected our, our kind of first 15 and uh, you're on the bench, you're a substitute. And that could go on week in, week out. So in a sense, you kind of never get to do what you're aiming to do, which is to, to play that sport. Um, and I was trying to think about that situation and, you know, certainly I had that, that experience many times where I was thinking, you know, I'm sitting here watching people play the sport that I want to play because I'm just sitting on the bench. What what can I do about it? What control can I have over it? Um, and I was thinking about that in relation to the concept of uh, choice, freedom of choice um, and being authentic um, because 
one of the kind of main tenets of existential philosophy is the idea that uh, you choose your own pathway and there's no, I mean, Sartre talks about no excuses. You can't, you can't blame on kind of anything outside because you always have a choice as to what action you take. And Sartre talks about the fact that then there, there'll never be a time in your life where you don't have a choice in some form or another. So even if, and he, he says, you know, even if um, a gunman holds a, a gun to your head and says your money or your life, you've still got a choice. It might not be a pleasant choice. It might not be a choice that you would particularly want, um, but you still have a choice, i.e. your money or your life. Um, and, uh, you know, and I was trying to think that that idea through in, in relation to being a substitute in sport. So do you choose to sit on that bench and accept um, your choice and accept that it is your choice? You know, you can't blame it on, you know, the coach for not selecting you. You can say, well, the coach, I don't think the coach made a right decision, but it's my choice to sit on this bench and to not play rather than to say, you know, I had no choice. I just got selected to stay on the bench. So I think I was trying to kind of think through those those ideas. I don't know, you know, whether those ideas have, have, have changed much since I wrote the paper. Was it 12 odd years ago? Um, but I certainly think that it, to me, the existential philosophy is not necessarily the truth about, um, you know, because obviously there are external factors that affect your situation and will affect what what choices you have. But for me, um, existential philosophy, I think, is useful in terms of a, a, an attitude to take, an attitude to take towards your own life to say, you know, I will take control over, over the decisions I make. I will accept the decisions I make. I might reflect upon them and say, you know, I I wouldn't have, well, wouldn't make the same decision today, but I will always take responsibility for my actions. Um, so that's kind of where I, where I came from and uh, where I got to. So hopefully that that kind of makes makes sense. I don't know how you read it. I don't know how you yeah. kind of kind of what you take mm-hmm. took from it. Yeah. So I think having only an individual sport background myself, so uh, I I cannot relate to being a substitute because I I haven't been a substitute. But I thought it was really interesting in terms of trying to think about what would be some of the kind of ways to apply this existential idea about authenticity to sport. And um, you actually, in the, in the paper, you refer to Colbertson, who has focused on individual sport. And, mm. and the argument would be that individual sports promote bad faith or elite individual sports. So what did he mean with that, if you can expand on that a little bit? Yeah, so this was a paper by Leon Colbertson. Um, I think it was called Bad, bad Faith. I can't remember the full title, but yeah, it was about bad faith in sport, and and um, in particular, my my reading of of that paper was that it it's about the attitude that you hold towards yourself. So, and this comes back to some of the stuff mm-hmm. that we were talking earlier in relation to just seeing yourself as an athlete. If you just see yourself as a as a body to be kind of used. Um, for the purposes of you know goals and sport, um, then you're in bad faith because you're not accepting the responsibility that you have towards yourself as a as a human being. So that kind of it talks about that that technological attitude in the sense of of just seeing literally just seeing yourself as a, as an as an instrument to be used in sport. Um, and those kind of metaphors that we talk about, you know, bodies breaking and being repaired and being fixed. It's a very an instrumental attitude towards the human. Well, actually, that's that's bad faith because you're not accepting yourself as a human being that has um, free will choices um, and can take responsibility for their actions. So that that was my reading of of Corbettson was it's about the way that you, the attitude that you, you as an athlete have towards yourself and and your body um, as such. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was just reading your paper this morning just to, again, remember the argument well. So I thought it was quite interesting when you were kind of putting this team and individual sports to having the opposite situation. So you were kind of saying that in the individual sport, you might have bad faith in in a way that you are focusing on your uh, transcendence while ignoring Mm -hmm. your facticity. So you're kind of just 
extending yourself and elite athletes kind of high, higher, faster, stronger, mm-hmm. as if there is no end. And, and there are always the limits. And, and then when you are talking in your paper about being a substitute and, and in a team sport, you would be rejecting your transcendence and focusing upon your facticity. So that would be, I'm just here as a substitute and I have no control over what's happening because it's not my decision because the coach has made me. And, and, and so I thought that was quite an interesting, we might be having this other, the situation kind of upside down when we talk about transcendence and facticity and how yeah. we relate to that. I, I think um, I, th- I think my views around that. Uh, well, I think that the environment around that has changed to a certain extent. So, um, some some of the more kind of individual sports, which tend to be much more quantifiable because it's all around kind of times or distance um, of quantifiable measurements, um, and there's the idea that you can always overcome that barrier. So you can always get faster, you can always get stronger, you can always jump higher. Um, Whereas traditionally, kind of team sports have not had those quantifiable measurements other than, you know, points scored. But how those points are scored, they haven't been quantified. So because there's so many kind of more factors at play, so let's say, you know, in in rugby or football, you've got a certain amount of players on the pitch and they interact with each other and those actions aren't quantifiable, certainly weren't quantifiable in the same way that, you know, running races were quantifiable. Um, And therefore... You, there was a kind of a much more present situation around playing rather than kind of thinking about beating particular measurements. Um, but I think that that has changed certainly over the last, you know, since, since I wrote the paper in team sports, because everything is trying to be more quantifiable. So for instance, in mm-hmm. well, in rugby, it is all about, you know, what's the distance that you've covered? How many tackles have you made? How much ground have you you made with the ball? And 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 so everything is trying to be more quantifiable. And I think that that now is a problem because and I and I've seen um athletes be selected or be not selected or or look at their their stats from a, from last week's game and they'll say oh you know i made there was three incomplete tackles or um actually i didn't make as much ground as i did the week before and and so there is that quantifiable kind of driver in team sports now that there probably wasn't 10 15 years ago um and that's at all levels. That's not just at the professional elite level. That's that's kind of trickling down to all levels of of team sports. And again, you know, come back to some of the other things that we were talking about. Is to to me that's a that's a real problem because suddenly you go go back to that. Um, I guess that bad faith in the sense that athletes are just seeing themselves as bodies that can be measured and performance can be measured rather than as as human beings. Mm-hmm. You know, with the, the richness of being human and all those other things that aren't quantifiable yeah and so let's let's move back to when you have been a substitute and you've written that paper and and you wondered about (laughs) can you be authentic while you're a substitute what what's the answer to that Uh, uh, yeah so i I, i'll come back to this why i think existential philosophy is is useful is that it provides you with an attitude that helps you understand kind of the situation um, and I think that you can be authentic and be a substitute as long as you take responsibility for the decisions that you make, i.e. to sit on that bench at the, on a Saturday afternoon. Um, and you say, yeah, you know, I've, I've accepted my, ch- I could have done something else. I could have, you know, thrown my toys out the pram and shouted at the coach. I could have decided that I wasn't going to turn up that day um I could have you know stormed onto the pitch and said I'm staying I'm playing you know I'm not staying on that bench so there's a whole host of different actions I could have taken but I chose to Mm -hmm. sit on this bench and I chose to um accept my decision to be a substitute so I think um yes you can you can be authentic because authenticity is about recognizing what it is to be human and recognizing that you have choices that you can make i don't want to get into this kind of uh, i guess the the deeper Mm. philosophical discussion around free will and around whether we really do have free will um because i think that that that, that's a very kind of complex question and there's obviously more and more evidence coming out that suggests that we don't have free will 
um, completely. But I think in terms of a way of looking yeah. at it, we can take responsibility for who we are and the choices that we make. Um, and I think that in itself is being authentic, is 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 recognizing what we what we could be or what we want to be, but also recognizing where we are and the choices that we've we've made in the past and take responsibility for those. And uh, I think another thing we we already talked about elite sport and we jumped in and out with that topic. And uh, it's maybe unfair to ask like what you meant in a paper that you wrote 12 years ago. <laughs> yeah, I, I, that's a trouble, you know. You... I'll just, yeah, so it might be unfair, but I think um, kind of what, caught my attention reading it again this morning was that you put out there that elite sport elite competitive sport might be promoting bad faith by its constituent factors so mm. i wonder what your thoughts on that would be today i don't i don't think that the that my views have changed on that because i do have and we've we've talked about this already i do have real concerns with elite sport because um, I, I think it 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 sets up athletes to think of themselves as um, instruments to be used in the pursuit of sporting goals, um, and I think that 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 is bad faith. And this is you know where we talked about earlier is is we need to provide athletes with the tools to be able to ask those philosophical questions around you know wh what am I doing? Why am I doing it? Um, you know how does it relate? How does me being involved in sport relate to other things that are important to me in my life um and so i think that elite sport if if we create these athletes that kind of just see themselves as tools to be used in the pursuit of sporting goals then we're going to end up in a situation which we, we find ourselves that you know they do they do have issues with um retirement life after sport um harm to their themselves in terms of their bodies and and their mental health um because they've just been used and they've complicitly accepted that use of the idea of, of driving sport towards other goals um so yeah i don't think my views on that have changed at all um in terms of what what is you know the the kind of the worst aspects of elite sport is that i think it does set up athletes to kind of forget about themselves as 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 real living humans and it just kind of they're just single-mindedly pursuing sporting excellence yeah and if we think of your experience of being a substitute and if we think of um and that was kind of issue that you set up as there's a possibility of being in bad faith if you're a substitute although you say it's not necessarily the case do you think there would be something in the in the kind of how the sport is set up that we could um what would you like to see changed in terms of perhaps allowing more opportunities for people to be authentic who play sport yeah so i i mean on a practical level i think that we should encourage um we should encourage as much participation as possible and therefore there's no reason why you can't and, and certainly lower leagues are doing this saying there's you know every player must get at least half a game And I think you you could even implement that at, at the elite level, so you don't end up with, um, you know, people on the bench week in week out. Um, I think that you could change the rules around substitutes to say that you know you, you can't be a substitute without being played for more. Well, I, I, as I say, you know, you make sure you at least get half a game on the pitch. I mean, the worst thing as a substitute was if you got to the end of a, a almost the end of a, a rugby match and then you got told by your coach you're going on for the last minute and you think great <laughs> you know last minute I can't even get into the game what can I do what is the point of putting me on for the last minute um and I think mm -hmm. to, to me that's that's bad that's bad coaching uh, and I, I, I don't know what coaches think about when they think oh well I must I must let all players get onto the pitch um so I'll give them you know one minute two minutes of play Um, actually, I think that we could, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. competition organizers could organize games so that they they ensured that there was much more participation. Um, I know that there's, you know, in, in, in elite men's rugby, there's been concerns around substitutes actually 
creating more um, risks of harm for players because it means that um, you know you've got these players that are not tired and not fatigued coming on at the end of games and then injuring players that have been on for the, for the, re- the whole of the game. Um, so there, there have been concerns mm-hmm. around kind of the use of substitutes in, in that way. Um, but I think, you know, I think you can change the rules of a sport so that um, you can enable more um, participation and you don't end up with a situation where, you know, players are not being able to play because they're just sitting on the bench waiting. Yeah. Those would be some of the ways that that we can actually change the rules. And what you were saying about changing the rules around substitutes also in elite sport, like there isn't any any kind of the nature of the sport or kind of that wouldn't really change it. So yeah, maybe maybe that's one of the ways ways forward with the substitute <laughs> question. Yeah, I think so. But I also think, you know, when when I've been coaching as well that it it is hard because you've got a situation whereby you can only select so many players to start a match and you you know you there will always be players that are disappointed because they're not selected to start and you you know there are no easy answers as a coach as to you I mean you could say well you'd have a rotational system so that you know players that yeah. didn't start this week will start next week um but actually that you know players themselves often don't like that because players say no we want the you know the best team to start or we want to make sure that we've got continuity and uh, rather than just chopping and changing all the time so there are no easy answers for a coach as to to how to ensure that you you're fair to all players um but certainly when i was coaching and i thought well you know they they i'm not here in terms of it's not a professional set up where actually winning does matter because um, if you don't win, then we kind of lose money or, you know, people lose their livelihoods. Um, certainly at, at, at a non-professional level, I think as a coach, I had a responsibility to ensure that all players play. There's no excuse to, to not mm-hmm. allow players to play. Um, and it's no excuse to allow players to play two minutes at the end of a game. That's, you know, that's not, for me, you know, you say, mm-hmm. okay, you need a good amount of time, whether that's 20, 30, 40 minutes, um, but you can't leave anybody on the bench for the whole of the, the whole of the match. Mm-hmm. And that comes back to amateur sport being uh, unserious and unimportant mm-hmm. in, in that way that we have discussed already. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was really nice to hear the story behind behind the paper. And, and like I mentioned, it was one of the papers that I read when I started exploring what what can I do with existentialism when I want to study sport. So, yeah, I, I very much enjoyed that paper back then and reading it today, I, I still do. So, yeah, thanks for that. Thank um, you. Then I just wanted to ask, um, what are you working on at the moment? What are some of the philosophical questions in in sport that you are wrestling with at the moment so i am working on two papers at the moment very different papers um one i am working on a i think i'm looking at i'm trying to apply a feminist ethics of care um to sport um and particularly to coaching in sport to say and and this comes back to some of those wider questions around you know what does good sport look like um how how should coaches interact with their athletes and uh, i think that there hasn't in terms of an ethical theory um i don't think that that uh, there hasn't been anything that's particularly applied kind of for feminist ethics of care to um, coaching in sport so that's what I'm trying to do is is trying to um, utilize that approach to think what 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 does coaching look like what does that kind of feminist ethics look, look like in, in coaching um, so that's one paper that um, I've kind of been working on and another paper which is completely different to that um, is m- more recently I've I've kind of been well with the kind of the the covid-19 pandemic and and looking at um the way that some sports have tried to produce kind of virtual um imitations of their own sport and thinking about well what as a spectator in sport what do we what do we want could a virtual um simulation of sport 
be as good or be better than the real thing. So I've been thinking around, you know, and, th- and this is not from a pl- kind of a participant's perspective, because I think um, the real experience of playing sport is obviously very different to um, playing sport on a on a games machine. But um, in terms of a spectator, what do we want? What does good sport look like? And can it be replicated in the kind of virtual world? So that's the, the other paper that I've been working on. Um, and hopefully that 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 should be out um well i i hope probably early next year if i get a move on and, and do that yeah i think with the covid situation and and how that's affecting all of us just kind of a thought that came to my mind that in existential thought that you've also drawn on your previous work is these ideas about disruptions as being sometimes illuminating or kind of challenging us to rethink our sport maybe just mm. kind of to finish up like um you're active in sport yourself and and how has this disruption maybe we can call it an existential disruption even how has that affected the way you are thinking about sport doing sport coaching in sport yeah i mean i'm i'm kind of in a way i'm lucky that i'm not involved in uh, elite sport uh, anymore and um i yeah i for me i've got to the age now where actually i'm just participating in sport for um its own sake for just enjoying it just um enjoying the social aspects of it and the the, the sort of health aspects of it um so over this time you know i try to keep myself active i've i've been using a, a kind of virtual platform um which is a, is a good motivational kind of tool i suppose if, if you're using those kind of virtual um classes um fitness classes um but i've also been lucky that um i've recently st- restarted playing cricket again and, and cricket in the uk was one of the first sports that was allowed to go back to to training and playing um so I, i've uh-huh. been very lucky in that respect whereas um i know that my my previous sport of rugby i think has been pretty hard hit because as a contact sport it's probably one of the last last sports um to go back at a kind of an amateur level um and i really do feel for yeah. kind of my 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 friends and uh, um acquaintances that are, yeah that have been struggling in terms of being able to get back to playing sport as they would like it um but for for me personally you know i've mm. been fairly lucky that i'm not i'm not involved in elite sport um anymore and uh, i can you know just still keep myself fit and active and and healthy that way but yeah it's been it's been tough and mm. uh I don't I think I think it will change sport I think this whole pandemic I my fear has been around women's sport in particular because as as well certainly in the UK um the sports the elite sports that have gone back are all men's sport you know men's football um men's rugby starting this yeah. weekend yeah whereas women's sport has just mm-hmm. been neglected and been forgotten and uh and that that to me is a real concern um because i think that it might well it just it just plays into i guess the narrative around women's sport not being important um and men's sport being you know the important thing that needs to take priority um mm. so i think that that's been yeah. a real concern um and i don't know what it will mean long term in terms of professional sport i hope that it will yeah i i understand there's a lot of people employed in in sport and sport is a commercial business but at the same time i think you know that perhaps it will the pandemic will affect elite professional sport because if you can't have those crowds back in the stadiums if you can't have the competitions um then people will no- need to find kind of other other avenues of of um engaging in sports and you know I, as i said I, i do wonder whether virtual sport might be one of those avenues um but for the for those mm that play i think yeah. maybe we will go back to a more kind of amateur non-professional um approach where it is around local local uh, competitions local leagues you know you won't get people flying across the world to go to a competition um and equally you won't get people probably traveling from one end of the country to the other so i think sport elite sport will change um some some aspects for the better and some mm. aspects not you know for the worst yeah yeah absolutely It was so interesting to have this discussion so 
I I really enjoyed our talk today and I learned a lot and I'm I am sure that our listeners will be learning a lot too. So thank you so much, Emily. No, it's been brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for joining us this week on Physical Activity Research Through Podcast. If you like the show, make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing or following the show on Twitter. This podcast is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you for your support. If you found value in the show, we would really appreciate a rating on Apple Podcast or whichever app you're using. Or if you would, in a real old school way, simply tell a friend about the show. It would be a great help for us. We have a fantastic lineup of guests for forthcoming episodes, so be sure to tune in. Thank you all for your support and have a great day.